Harriet, hello. Tell me how um, businesses get started with responsible tourism initiatives. I think, first of all, it's about the businesses having the idea and the realisation about the difference that they can make, that they can put responsibility at the heart of tourism. And we've just seen today some absolutely fantastic initiatives from tiny, small organisations doing tours with the homeless of London through to actual major players seeking to minimise their carbon footprint, for example. And so I think it often starts from somebody having that commitment and wanting to do the right thing, realising that it's a business opportunity, that the public do want to play their part in building responsibility, and then often it gets a momentum of its own because, of course, success breeds success, and when people see responsible tourism doing well and flying, when they see that the public want it, of course, that encourages them to do more and engage more deeply. Thank you. Now, following on from that theme, you talked about scaling up, the industry needing to scale up its efforts now. How do they do that? They've obviously taken it on board, the people in the room. How do they then scale up? Well, something like today's awards are obviously really important in putting the spotlight on and celebrating some of the fantastic initiatives that are going on out there. And indeed, today, World Responsible Tourism Day also seeking to put the challenges out as well, to saying to the industry, all is not lovely in the garden. And so I think these are two very important building blocks, but I think it's for every business leader in tourism to go home and think about what can they do more and how can they really go from good to being great, to really driving that change so it's not a little CSR add-on that's nice for PR, it really is at the heart of their business that they're driving change and that can be both individual companies, it can also be governments, governments can play their role in helping support those kind of initiatives and absolutely it's overarching industry bodies like this celebration, this exhibition we have here which is really helping to push it higher and higher up the agenda. Just taking what you've just said there about taking it higher up the agenda, do you find in your experience leading the organisation over the past 10 years that it really slips when we have economic turmoil? Well, I work at the Fair Trade Foundation, and so we offer products like tea and coffee and bananas to the public. And it's an extraordinary success story, actually proving how decent the public are. The public want to play their part in tackling poverty. Of course, everybody loves a bargain. You think, oh, marvellous, those bananas are cheap. When the public hear why they're cheap, actually they're shocked and they say, no, I would rather pay a bit more to buy fair trade bananas, secure in the knowledge that the farmers and workers are getting a fair deal. And the incredible thing is that even in these difficult economic times, our sales last year rose by 40%. I mean, that's really testament to the basic decency of the public. And I think that's an incredibly inspiring story for the tourism industry, who are struggling at the moment. It is difficult for the tourism industry, but actually the public are almost wanting those values to be more than ever to be at the heart of everything they do. Because in tough times, I think you go back to your really core values. And at the end of the day, everyone's core values are about people and wanting to do the right thing by other people. So although it's difficult, it would seem to me this is the time for the tourism industry to really think about let's offer something completely different that appeals to people's basic human nature and that helps tackle poverty overseas. In a US uh, session yesterday on, on travel trends, there was a survey mentioned, I think it was by Apple Hotels, that, that consumers uh, you know, wanted to see green initiatives, they wanted to see responsible tourism initiatives, but not at the expense of comfort. So is there a sort of disconnect? Do they, can they go hand in hand? Oh, I think they absolutely have to go hand in hand. There will be those members of the public who want to go and, you know, live it rough, and maybe stay with the farmers and actually help with the coffee harvest. There will be some people who want those experiences. But there are many, many others who want their tourist package to be as good as ever. No compromise on the quality, the comfort, but to be sure that it's doing right and playing fair by the local community. Are you seeing real drive and, and an appetite for it to get to the top of the, of the boardroom agenda? Oh, I think the sustainability agenda is absolutely on the increase. There was a report by PwC now a few years ago when they actually said the sustainability agenda will only rise in business circles. And actually, the smart companies are the ones who get in there early and get advantage by winning customer support and loyalty for doing the right thing. 
but in the end every business will have to do it and the ones who get their dragged there kicking and screaming at the end they won't get any advantage out of it it was a bit like the internet was the analogy they used they said in the beginning the people who benefited from the internet were the early adopters in the end everyone's used the internet so if i was in tourism i would want to be one of the early adopters out there getting the advantage from showing how to do things differently how to do it things responsibly and providing that kind of leadership I was just wondering what events or happenings led you to be so passionate and interested and, and involved ultimately with the fair trade industry? Uh, I first got involved with fair trade when I was working for a small NGO that was thinking how can it be that the bananas in our shops are getting cheaper and cheaper all the time? We got invited by some banana workers and trade unionists in Costa Rica to visit them and to understand the corners that have been cut in, a, in order to make bananas cheaper for you and me. And they told me about how, for example, they had been spraying with a chemical even though it was known to have a negative impact on the human reproductive system. And I met a woman who gave birth to a baby whose head was four times bigger than its body. And I knew then there had to be a different way to do world trade. That yes, we want our products cheap, but not cheap at any price. And at that time, there were coffee farmers in Mexico facing absolute same crisis. Coffee prices were so low, they could no longer feed their children. And they had started to think, what if we put a mark on a product so the public knew that the farmers and workers had had a fair deal? And so they came up with this brilliant idea of fair trade, which then moved from coffee to bananas, to tea, to chocolate, to sugar. And so it's gradually spread, and indeed has even now been picked up by people within the tourism industry. And fair trade in tourism South Africa is today launching the first fair trade certified tourist package piloting something in South Africa that may in the end become part of our global system in fair trade. Fascinating. And you said um, earlier that last year saw a 40% increase in, in sales and various fair trade food and drink items. Do you think that's a, as a consequence of a raising public awareness of fair trade issues? W would you say that's a fair assumption? Absolutely. The growth in fair trade is first and foremost down to the public. Um, and it's also about the public talking to their friends and family and their communities about fair trade is what's driven it forward. So we have a mad scheme called Fair Trade Towns, where a local town will commit that all the tea and the coffee in the council will be fair trade. The schools are talking about fair trade in the assemblies, that the local news agent through to the supermarket is offering fair trade. And that enables the grassroots social movement for fair trade to build step by step in their local community because they ask the restaurant or the bar to have fair trade. They suggest it to their workplace or to their health club. And through that, it has grown into this incredible movement so that today, nine out of 10 people know about fair trade they recognise the mark, they trust it, they want to play their part, and they buy the products. But I have to say it's also down to businesses who have responded to that very clear message from the public and who have seen the opportunity that it presents them to do the right thing in terms of tackling poverty while also meeting consumer demand. And finally, um, I believe you have a book out. Um, I was just wondering if you could tell me a little bit about that, what the objective of the book is and what themes are, are covered. Um, well, I wrote a book called Fighting the Banana Wars and Other Fair Trade Battles because the growth of fair trade over the past 20 years has been a long and difficult journey and we have made plenty of mistakes along the way. There have been the things that didn't go so well and the things that went wrong. But at the end of the day, it's an incredibly inspiring story of the power of ordinary shoppers, of ordinary people and ordinary farmers and workers to make a difference when they come together. And so I wanted to tell those stories, the stories of the farmers from India through to the banana farmers of Costa Rica, from the coffee farmers of Mexico, through to those like people in tourism seeking to find new ways to take the principles into new industries. And so that people could see that story and actually feel inspired to create change in their own lives and in their own industries. It's actually what I always say when I talk to kids. I say the story of fair trade is the story of the difference that you can make. Because when we started, everyone said we were mad, it would never work, it would never fly. And now we're in a position where last year sales in Britain of fair trade were over one billion. And that just shows the power of a 
bright idea to fly around the world if ordinary people will all play their part.